I'm Holly Constant. And I'm Maddie Hockaday. We really love Parks and Rec, and we really love behind-the-scenes details. So we're researching everything from DVD extras like deleted scenes and commentaries. Plus, interviewing cast and crew who actually worked on the show. We also bring on guests and friends to geek out about everything Parks. So join us, you tropical fish. This is literally the best Parks and Rec rewatch podcast. We're your park pals. There's a park and some pals, and there's also therapy, too. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Park Pals. Yay, we have such a treat for you. Oh, my gosh. We have been wanting to have a producer on the show, and I'll say this 1,000 times during the interview, but luckily we got to have Norm Hiscock on, and he is amazing, and just we learned so much information, Mm -hmm. and I will say the first, um, I don't know, maybe 20-ish minutes or so uh, was not necessarily about parks. It was more about his trajectory and like how he got involved with this kind of line of business and all that stuff, and I just found it so interesting to learn about his history, so um, so that you're going to get a treat as far as like learning a lot about the behind the scenes like crew information so um so yeah we hope that you enjoy it yeah and I mean on top of that you learn a lot about what producers do and all those different roles but then also get to hear a little bit about his writing with Parks and Rec and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. too so there's definitely some Parks and Rec nuggets in there too (laughs) Yeah, totally. I feel like we kind of flop all over the place with, Mm -hmm. you know, things that just kind of come to our mind because he's also worked on SNL, King of the Hill, um, just a a kids in the hall, like a bunch of stuff that, uh, you know, kind of all ties into where he has gotten his experience from. So um, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine we talk about as well, which he worked on and wrote on. So there's just like a lot of information in here in a short amount of time. So he did great answering all my questions. And I am positive, like I told him, that I will have more questions when we get to his specific episodes but for now uh, we got some really good stuff so yes so enjoy this wonderful interview and we appreciate you norm for taking the time to talk to us yes thank you norm and here he is now there's a park and some pals and there's also therapy too Yay, we were just talking about um, Vancouver. Or that's what you said, right? Vancouver, that's where you are? Vancouver Island. Oh, what's that? What's the difference? I'm sorry. I'm well, totally Va- It's ignorant. across from um, Van- Vancouver the city is on the mainland, and Vancouver Island is across from Vancouver the city. Oh. And it's got Victoria, which is the capital of B.C. Okay. Do you have to take, is there like a bridge? You have to take a like ferry? A ferry. What's, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, that's so cool. Yeah. I'm learning so many things. <laughs> <laughs> do you like Nashville? I, I do like it. It's growing yeah. on me. Um, it's not my forever place, if I'm being completely honest. Right. It's just not like where I want to end up, I think. But it has been really good uh, for like music, which is what I do, and also like friendships, of course. But also it's so central, so I've been able to visit so many more places than I would have been able to if I was in L.A. Plus like financially – LA was impossible when you're trying to create your own work and fund your own work, so it's kind of tough. But when I moved, uh, I went. I didn't move there, but I went to visit uh, Nashville, um, uh, and my friend was there, and it was his fiftieth birthday. And every cab you got into said, "This is the fastest growing city. It's costing so much money now." And I was just wondering if it's really, if the is it is yes. it hard to live there now? Yeah. Um, Oh, it's not hard to live here, but it's right. definitely growing, um, right. even within the last year or two. Um, so it's been wild. I feel like so many people have moved here from everywhere, but especially California. A lot of the Californians right. are kind of catching on to like the tax uh, brackets and how much less taxes are and all that good stuff. But um, but yeah, it's definitely growing. And I personally, and I think a lot of people feel this way, um, Nashville just isn't ready for it or isn't really growing with it if that makes sense. right yeah like, make total sense yeah you know like public transit and roads and all that kind of stuff but i think we're getting there i think we're getting there um hopefully leadership is getting a little bit more like in tune with what needs to happen in the city but we'll see <laughs> yeah for sure because my friend there is a musician and so they uh yeah it's a great place i guess for music right i mean totally. my wife i loved it my wife didn't like it so much but it, she, i'm a big music fan so 
Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That that is another thing too. I mean, it's so creative and there's so many opportunities as far as like not just to play music but to see music. Right. Like everywhere you go, there's just talent, you know. It reminded me a little bit of Austin. Like Austin had had that sort of like vibe of any place you walk into, you could see a great band and yeah. And just uh, you hear great music. Yeah, I've heard that too. I have never been to Austin, but I have oh, heard I think you very would love similar yeah. things. Yeah, it's a great place. Yeah. Awesome. Oh my God. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I really, really appreciate it. I have been, Norm, I've been wanting to have a producer on the show since we started. Maddie can attest to that. Yes. Um, <laughs> I am just like so interested in the process and the behind the scenes of it all, which is what this whole entire podcast is about. But so I usually, we usually start with asking how you got your job on parks, which we will get to, but I feel like I'm going to be a little unorthodox this time and kind of asked about uh, your trajectory into being a producer and how you kind of started. Cause I know you were a writer first. And yes. so I was wondering kind of how that led into everything. And so what's your story? My story. <laughs> Well, yeah, I took film. I was in Calgary, Alberta in Canada, and I took film. I thought I wanted to do film and maybe shoot film. And then at the same time, I um, was interested in improvising and never improvised before. And I joined oh. this theater there called Loose Moose Theater. And it was uh, it was sort of like headed by this guru, Keith Johnstone, who um, just passed away, actually. And um, uh, he uh, and I met people. Uh, like-minded people uh, in doing improvising. So it was like uh, Bruce McCullough and um, and Mark McKinney, and they uh, ended up being in the kids in the hall. Mm. So when I ended up, when they Which got- Which you the, have a poster of for those yes, people for that movie. cannot see on the yeah. podcast. Norm has um, a lovely poster in the background. And I co-wrote the movie with them. They they had a chance to do a movie, and so that got me into writing uh, co-writing the movie with them. But uh, I ended up doing the series uh, with them when they were looking for writers. So, and I ended up being a head writer. So I just found my way into writing, although I also liked taking uh, photography and was a cameraman. So that was my, my intro into it. And Lauren Michaels was uh, the producer, executive producer of that show. Of Kids in the Hall? Of Kids in the Hall. What? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I when, get to SNL too. So that's yeah. awesome. Okay. And so uh, we were doing the movie, and, um, and when the show went down, Kids in the Hall eventually stopped uh, doing the show. And then uh, Lauren uh, offered me a job to go to right for Saturday Night Live. So um, I was just looking for work at that time. <laughs> I had two children, and so I was just uh, happy to be working. And so I was living in New York and doing that. And then when I was – I had been doing sketch comedy for almost – seven years and then i thought i got an offer to do uh, king of the hill and so uh and lauren and uh, not lauren michaels but uh, greg daniels mm -hmm. was the producer and then greg ended up being the producer of course of parks and recreation and created it with uh, mike sure so when that came about further down the road yeah um uh, I I jumped at that opportunity as well because Greg does great uh, TV shows and sitcoms I enjoyed and I enjoyed working on um, King of the Hill. So uh, yeah, he always gets together great casts and great. Uh, he looks for sort of the hot who uh, comic actors of the time, mm -hmm. and so uh, uh, for both shows we had great casts. And so I was just happy uh, because I worked in with comedians. Yeah, uh, like Kids in the Hall and also like um, um, Saturday Night Live. I really just wanted to work with those types of people. That is so wild. Okay, yeah. I never knew about that. So it was Kids in the Hall in Canada then, and then you moved to New York, or correct? Okay, gotcha. And what was uh, what was Saturday Night Live like? Like how well, did that transition a... from? Because it obviously it's scripted to. Well, I mean, not that SNL is not scripted, but you know yeah, what I mean. It's like all so different. It is different for sure because just it was live. And so uh, I enjoyed the live aspect when I got into improvising. Yeah. Um, and then, um, but as on uh, Kids in the Hall, we did a lot of films and short films. And I really enjoyed that. And I got into, I started when I was in, um, you know, I was taking film school. So I really enjoyed that part of it. 
Mm-hmm. And so when I went to Saturday Night Live, it was more live than film. Yeah. And um, I didn't enjoy that aspect of it all that much. Mm. Um, uh, and it's it's not as visual. It's a little more um, uh, chatty and more dialogue driven and performance driven. So um, uh, when I got the offer to do animation, uh, which was King of the Hill, I really liked the, that part of it with the single camera and it was closer to doing filmic stuff. Totally. Did you have that um, experience that a lot of, I hear a lot of writers have where like they pitch something or, and it's like super funny when they're writing it and then at dress rehearsal, it's just like crickets. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Everybody. Yes. I had that a lot. I would do really well at the table and get chosen and then uh, you do it. It's um, Yeah. And for sure, we'd get crickets, and and there was a there's a tons of reasons. There's so many variations yeah. of why it works and doesn't work. Um, you know, there I had I remember writing a sketch and doing it for John Turturro. Died at the table. Had Phil Hartman come come in, and I just wanted to hear the sketch do well because I knew it worked uh, in my head. Mm-hmm. And then had <laughs> Phil Hartman do it, and it killed at the table, but then wasn't chosen so there's totally. very reasons uh of why things work and don't work um yeah did you ever crack the code <laughs> well it's so uh, because it's uh no it's a, a, sometimes you write a sketch for a host that just is won't do it and then you write a thing mm-hmm. for someone who's comedian and he has too many choices at the table like uh, um jim carrey the jim carrey show i did one that was chosen did really well. It was one of the many that was chosen, but then wasn't chosen for air because he had, he had too many choices and he was so good at being funny. Totally. That he, yeah, it was all like, well, I, what I, a feast in front of him, you know? Sure. Yeah. What he could put. Yeah, and I'm him. assuming that goes both ways because I feel like I've heard of a lot of people that have written and then for whatever reason that host, like it, that sketch might just not fit their strengths or what they can yeah. bring to the table or whatever. Um, so, and I can't imagine because when you're writing on a show that has well developed characters and cast that you are, are like you eventually write to them almost, but yeah. you can't really do that with a new person every time. And then you're kind of going off of like what they have done in the past, but they've done so many different things. So it's like, what do I focus on? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes in the years that I was there, it was hard. No, it wasn't hard to get host, but it was um, it was not the best period mm. of SNL. So I think people were, um, it, you would go in and look to see who was going to be the guest. You wouldn't know. And so you just write sketches. Right? Sure. And, then, mm. and then that some people are really good at writing very quickly for that host that week. And then some um, people are not good at doing that. And then. Yeah. Uh, you know, you try and team up with the performers if you can, you know. Right. Like Anna Gastar, I ended up teaming with, and that was fun. And she was fun to write with. And, and you know, I wrote with uh, Adam McKay, who was a very good oh, writer yeah. and producer. Yeah, wow. and, but um, uh, it was all performance driven, and then not performance driven, but writ- writer driven. So it mm-hmm. was like uh, those are writer pieces were harder to get on. They're competing yeah. with performer pieces, you know, so. Yeah, I did see in my research that you were there when Tom Petty performed, and I was wondering if you remember that at all, or if you were there. <laughs> so well, random question. Remember, I'm just a I huge don't remember fan. Tom. I, I was a huge Tom Petty fan too, and uh, on, you mean on King of the Hill, or? Oh no, I meant on SNL when oh, he was SNL. a musical King, guest. But Tom Petty was a, a character on King of the Hill. What? Wow! And I just missed him. <laughs> he played this character called Lucky, and I just missed him. How did I not know that? That's yeah. wild. I'm going to have to go watch that now. Uh, but I saw Tom Petty in Vancouver, actually, uh, after six years of the band being together. And I saw that anniversary. It was a lot of fun to see that performance. Oh, my uh-huh. God. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Oh, I know. I wasn't. I don't think I was like in the age um, range of when he would was still alive to be performing. I don't know why, but I just wasn't. So, um, but yeah. Oh, my gosh. That seems Yeah, amazing. I was a fan. He he just wrote very good pop Hooks of course. And, yeah, oh my he's god. A great you think writer. of all the songs he's written. Yeah. It's incredible. But I was just wondering because I know I hear a lot of like people who sometimes have musical guest stories or random stories of when people are on SNL. So I was just yeah. a very random question. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, no, I uh we rarely wrote for 
the the Jim Carrey one. I think it was uh, who was uh, I'm trying to remember. We had a band pop in to uh, had a guest spot in that, mm. and, and that normally guarantees something getting on because you had the, also the musical guest be in it, yeah. but it didn't get on. So yeah, dang it. Yeah, yeah. Well, are the writers always there during um, show night? I don't know why yes. I don't know that. Okay, great. Okay. And that was part of the thing is that uh, I became as uh, on Kids in the Hall because I was a head writer and also we were sort of there in on the producing of it and yeah. all the pieces. It was more hands on. And then Saturday Night Live, you ended up producing your own pieces. Sure. And then when I went to uh, uh, King of the Hill, you ended up seeing your sketches all the way or your scripts all the way through. Got it. And you're overseeing the animation. And then when it went to Parks and Recreation, it was the same thing, too. It was the, gotcha. You were on set and you were there on set for your uh, For your script. piece. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. gotcha. And then so, I mean, tell me a little bit about, like, how the producing started as far as, like, you were writing first and then did someone ask you to be a producer? Like, how did that all work out? No, it's just part of it. It was that you wanted to make sure that your piece was uh, – uh, that you were there for the performers. So like on Kids in the Hall, you were there on set and they had questions and you were there in the editing. So uh, you um, that just was ended up being part of the process. I don't happens. think it's so much now. It's separated a little bit more, but um, you know, yeah, I know I was over overseeing it. And Greg Daniels was a big believer of writer-producers. Sure. And so he pushed that. And that's how uh, Mike Shore... Uh, during the office years, he was part of overseeing and became a producer. He just got pushed into, um, not got pushed into, they just wanted you there. Yeah, just kind because, of. Because, yeah, and Greg in. couldn't oversee everything and he didn't want to oversee everything. So um, he said, you know, you, you know, you oversee your, uh, you have questions. You, ha- you always ask questions in the beginning, but they would have senior writers walk you through it and, um, by the time I hit Parks and Rec, I had done a lot of producing. So, um, yeah, yeah. Were you you wrote a few on Parks though too, right? Oh yeah, I wrote ten. Okay, that's mm-hmm. what I thought. And so, yeah. um, how did you? Well, this I guess is my question that I asked everybody, or our question that we asked everybody. But how did you get your start with Parks? Then was it just Greg telling you about it? Um, which yeah, is kind of, you kind of already answered it, but I just wanted to see like what the process was for that. Yeah, I was working back in Canada. My father was. Uh, got nailed so I moved back to Canada and I was there and I was working in Canada for a while and then Greg said we're doing this new show do you want to are you interested and I said sure and they hadn't they had some of the cast not a lot of the cast but uh, um, and just I met with Mike Shore to make sure that I you know we got along with Mike and because he's going to be he's a co-creator so I got along with Mike and we had a nice meeting and then I was just uh, there was they it was a small budget. It was supposed to be 13 episodes and it ended up being six, I think, because Amy was pregnant. I yes. Think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's so wild. What was the first episode that you wrote? Do you remember? Yes, it was a rock show. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you were also in, um, well, and I mean in because it was the um, – Oh my gosh, the one where she is, it's like the, oh, I forgot what the name of it is, but basically she's standing in front of the black and white pictures um, of all the oh, men yes, in yeah, City yeah. Hall and you and another one, uh, another there, producer, I think. Dan is, Gore, I think, had pictures too uh, of himself up on that wall. I think Dan was in it. And, it was uh, so funny yeah. though. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> the, all the little Easter eggs. <laughs> Yeah, it they, they just gets it's because it just makes it fun for everyone, and then then they need pictures on the wall, so they just totally. Yeah, you go down, you put on some glasses, and put on a jacket, and you're there for. <laughs> right. And they take five pictures, and they just want it to be quick and easy, right, for totally. themselves too. Right, mm-hmm. but then but it ends up being per- fun for everybody yes. who totally. watches the show, right? Because now yeah. we're we're talking about it, and it's like this person who wrote ten episodes is in all these episodes in a picture, which is yeah, really cool. yeah. Yeah, it's more fun for my daughters who watch the show. Right. <laughs> <Who gets> the <laughs> totally. Show. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah, and it's something for the crew, too, um, yes. as opposed to just the audience. You know, you guys mm-hmm. can, like, look at it and see that it forever. <laughs> yeah. 
But um, but as a producer, then were you you were I'm guessing involved in every episode for the most part, right? Yeah, different stages of every episode. So it's yeah, the, yeah. You're in the breaking of the story. So they we have like an area of an idea that we like, and so we would sit. I would sit in a room with people, and someone else is writing it, and you help them sort of uh, break it into three acts, and mm-hmm. so and then you put it up on a a cork board, and you have cards. And then, you know, Mike or Greg would be in there. In the, in the early years, it was Mike and Greg. And then later on, it was just mostly Mike. But mm-hmm. um, uh, And you would sort of say, here's the story. And you pitch it out to them. And they go, oh, that's good. That doesn't quite work. Or, uh, oh, uh, you, you know, um, OK, that A story works. Maybe we need a B story now. Mm-hmm. And then so you end up then going back to the board and putting in a B story to fill it out more. And we ended up, I think mostly, sometimes it was A stories that um, touched on everybody, or we'd have separate A, B, C stories that that uh, people would do. And then, well, I, so you would send out a writer, and while that's going on, another script is coming back because the script was written. Mm-hmm. And so you're now part of the rewriting team of um, rewriting it and rewriting sketches, and you get notes and from Greg and Mike and also from... Um, the studio and so you're uh, addressed sometimes addressing those or not addressing those and then um yeah it's just like at different stages of the of, yeah and it it's always revolving like, yeah but i guess i um this is why i'm so glad you're here because i had so many like misconceptions or just questions about what kind of things or responsibilities a producer might have just because it sounds like what you're describing is just being in the writer's room as a writer um and but it's like you have the producer umbrella as well yes you know uh yes so there were like other producers but like in like on um i was a co-executive producer on um King of the Hill. So I would, uh, we had mini rooms, we would call them. So mm-hmm. uh, Greg would give notes on a script and you would go off and I would take two or three people, the writer and two other writers, and we would go through his notes mm-hmm. and rewrite scenes. Okay, gotcha. And then bring them back to him. And then he would say, oh, this is good. Or uh, no, you didn't get my note. Or, or sometimes mm-hmm. in the room we would say, uh, you know, how about we do it like this? And we would take it to Greg and he would sometimes like it or he mash up two uh, things. So I would, it would be mini rooms. Like I would, you still need someone to sort of run that room, you know? Right. And that would be your job is yeah. to like run it. Oh, okay. Interesting. And then as a producer for your, you, the producing aspect of it would come in where you would, if you're, you know, after all that rewriting is done, you've done a table read with the cast and you've done another rewrite before you're shooting, um, you're on set. And mm-hmm. then um, you make producer decisions then too, saying we're going to, like uh, Amy would sometimes say, you know, uh, this is a good joke. I love this stuff. And you would have extra jokes that you could show her. We call them candy bags that. Uh, yes. Yeah. So you would show them and they would go, ah, is there something else? And you would work it out with them on the, on the day. So that's the producing aspect of it where you're making a decision and deciding that, yeah, we can take extra time. And you would talk to the director too, who was also on um, there. And then you would say, let's take time to figure this out. And they, they were always want to figure it out and make sure that the um, performers were happy with the, right. what they were saying or not saying, or there was, you know, the confusion was, you know, or, in terms of story or in terms of a joke, why why am I saying this at this point in the story, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm dumb, but I just feel, <laughs> I feel like all writers are essentially producers then. Like, yeah. I don't know. Well, yes. Sometimes, though, you get on shows that don't, aren't, you're just not part of that process. And so you're mm-hmm. not on set and you're just. Right. And, you, and it was brought back to you and you just watch it and you go, oh, okay, it turned out good. Okay. So someone else was doing it producing. See. Yeah. So in that case, it, would you say a lot of producers come from a writing background or would you say that even just having your writing background made you a better producer because you kind of had that experience? Yeah, I had it made me uh because I had uh sort of this writer producer background already and I worked with performers. 
And I think that that is helpful. But Greg also pushed this writing producing aspect. He mm-hmm. believed in it and he liked it. Um, so uh, you wrote the script, see it through all the way to the end. Why not? You know, uh, like why? And then he, that takes the, the responsibility off his plate a little bit. But then he could just oversee it or or come in at certain aspects if it wasn't going in, in the way that he thought it would go. Um, yeah. But we always use performer uh, and writers. Like I remember um, the episode... The Penguin episode was the first episode back for the second season. And there was sort of like, not an agenda, but for sure, a push to have more uh, topical stuff. And that was Mm -hmm. one of them. And we decided, we sort of, that was the first time we sort of like uh, said, well, let's sit down and talk about a topic. And I think Mm -hmm. gay marriage came up. And then so that idea came out of that. And then... um, so I was on set for the whole thing, but I remember coming back and we were editing and, and the third act wasn't quite landing. We hadn't, mm. we had an ending, but we were searching for an ending, I think. Mm. And I remember Katie Dippold, who was one of the writers on the mm. show, um, said, that's your ending there. I remember we were, because we watched the, we were watching it back mm. and we were sort of playing with what the ending would be and she said there's your ending and then I went oh I like that and Greg was there and he said yeah I like that too so we just moved that the scene yeah yeah, that seemed too early in the storytelling back to the ending and then we went no that's that's sort of a good character moment for Leslie let's place that there and I think we had done we had improvised like a I think there's something like 14 takes for that. Wow. And it was a crazy scene where it sort of, it was just on a TV set. So it, it wasn't like it just a scene. It was a very long scene. So yeah, um, I think we did variations on a theme of like, no, I don't like that. Or, oh, trying to get along or, yeah. Um, so we found it, you know, it wasn't, um, we didn't nail it in the writing. So interesting. Um, yeah. That's I mean that was a great ending of that episode to take yes. them to the the zoo or whatever it was. Um, um Yes, that was in the script I think, but uh mm-hmm. but the the actual TV show where she was on the set um Oh, like Jones show? Yeah, the Jones mm-hmm. show we didn't okay. we weren't sure oh, where that should I end. I understand. Yeah. Okay. That's so fascinating. Yeah. I love seeing how the puzzle pieces all work out. That's yeah. one of my favorite questions too, of like what was in the script versus what wasn't and all that kind of stuff. So that's awesome to know. Yeah. I, I'm a big believer of the box being open all the time, like right mm-hmm. until the end that you have to close the box. So you could always put things in, take things out yeah, and, uh, and move pieces around just because we said it would go here. It doesn't necessarily mean it should go there. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Is and that, one of oh go ahead Maddie sorry Holly I was just gonna ask is that because uh, it sounds like Greg Daniels had like a unique way of kind of running the set all together and the process is that kind of uh, unorthodox on a TV a little, show a little bit um, uh, and uh, I would say that um, people who are comfortable with it are fine with it like Amy's a very she's a great improviser and a lot of mm-hmm. the people we had on there are very comfortable with improvising. So um, to to play like that is as fun for I think everyone at a certain point. Once you get to know the material too, and you've writ, you've done the script because we've worked hard on the script, so you kind of want to do the script to see if mm-hmm. it works. But sometimes it just isn't working, mm-hmm. and or it feels a little stiff. Or mm-hmm. and so to have them on set and they've done the scene, they can sort of make it feel a little more relaxed and not Mm -hmm. so written you know and I think Greg is always open for that and he likes improvising I think um and he also loved that uh format of doing the fake documentary because you can expose things in ways that you can't do when you're Mm -hmm. well and it also seemed like all the shows that Greg was show running or created um well especially The Office and I don't know about King of the Hill I'm not as as uh, big of a watcher of that one but The Office and um Parks I feel like he just um and 
everybody that was heading the show, like Steve Carell and Amy Poehler, like there was no ego involved. It was always like, what's the funniest? And if it's not my line, then make it somebody else's line. Or like if it doesn't land in the way that it's meant to with like that scene, move it over here. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't really a lot of, from what I'm seeing, a lot of, um, you know, just like self-involvement. You know what I mean? No, just as long as it made sense in terms of character. I'd say all of them have character Mm -hmm. comedy as the push, you know, and so... Is it true to the character? You can trade off lines, but only if it made sense in terms of like more, this character would say that, not my character or. Right. Yeah. You just to say, I don't want to do the line and then yeah. you have someone else. Do it. <laughs> that was never no. a thing, you know? Yeah, totally. That makes sense. Also, my other question about producers, and I think that this is a lot of people, um, because I have a theater background, too, is that I'm thinking like producers are like the money people. Now, is that like a thing, too? No, they're creative producers. Like, I feel like there are creative producers, then there there are producers who are just money people. Okay. So, uh, but I think, um, so... Greg, I would say, has an executive producer credit. I've, I, I've had the executive producer credit on shows. And you have to weigh all the things that uh, are best for the production. That's what mm-hmm. I would say that a writer, producer, executive producer does. Is sort of okay. go, it's always the story and what's best for the story and what's best in terms of uh, where the spending is. Sometimes you, you, you overspend in some areas you don't want to. But uh, for the most part, you're thinking of what's, uh, best for what we want to get on screen in mm. terms of telling the story. So, like when you had an executive producer position, were you looking at budgets and things like that as well, and locations oh, yeah. and all that? Yes, and you, you know you're sort of surprised at where money is being spent, but at the same time, you, that's the way it's being spent. And then you're saying, well, how can we do that? And I think sometimes it hurts the storytelling because you're taking shortcuts. You know? Yeah. Um, but you just don't want it to be obvious. You don't want it to, to go, oh, well, uh, never do you want it to hurt the story. Sure. Uh, and and then tell the story through the character's eyes, too. It's so yeah. you're trying to do as best as possible. But you're always fighting to say, could we do something more visual instead of just have people tell the audience what the story is? You know, mm-hmm. you want to show it instead of just telling them about it. Yeah. I mean, did you ever have to be like the bad guy and say, no, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't spend that money on this. Oh, um, yeah, sure. But also I've been the bad guy in terms of like been the jerk uh, with the people who have the money to say, I want to tell it like this. And then uh... they're going, we don't want to do it like that. You go, well, that's what we need to do. Or we're, I guess we're just like, why are we telling this? The way That's we interesting. are. Yeah. Can mm-hmm. you think of any like specific examples of that? Well, there was the show hear. People of Earth that I did with Greg Daniels that was about aliens. And so uh, they would say, can we do it in a way that is uh, cheaper? And you go, look, we have aliens on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to go into makeup and we have to put them in makeup. And then uh, they're in space and they have to appear and there's special effects and I know you want to do it for cheap, but this is the show that you picked up. And so uh, I we're doing our best right. to do it. You know, we were shooting it in Canada. We're like, uh, you know, we're doing it on the fly. We're trying. And then the actors would say, can we get more takes, you know? And you're saying, yes, we would like you to do more takes. So you're not having to nail it in two takes and move on. Like you have to pick and choose those moments. Mm. So it's always like you're juggling that stuff all the time. Gotcha. And you want to fight for the writers uh, and the also for the, in terms of writing and getting some time to figure out an arc. Totally. Because you, you, you have 13 episodes or 10 episodes or how many episodes. And so you want it to make sense. And totally. you want the writers to have that time to figure it out. And also you want the actors to have time to work with, uh, when they're on set, just to not feel like they're being pushed around, that they can actually find the scene a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. and have time to do that. Plus, like, with Parks times, like, you know, 2000s or whatever, um, I mean, it was 24, 25 episodes. I mean... Crazy amount. But, but, yeah, that that documentary feel um, can get you uh, more time in terms of uh, like being on set in a room with actors, just being with actors. And that's true. So, uh, but you still wanted some visual 
aspects to it, you know, like you didn't want it just to be people just talking in a room. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I feel like with that mockumentary style, um, Maddie and I talk about this all the time where the camera catches such uh, like facial expressions and Mm. such subtle uh, nuances that would not be uh, there in, you know, a regular episodic, you know. Yeah, it's rough shooting, too. It's like cross shooting. So you have two cameras rolling at the same time. So you're always covered that if someone improvises something that you caught it. Right. Exactly. Um, and but the, the in Canada they do they don't like cross shooting because they want to light it so oh. they're worried about lighting and stuff. Interesting. So so they shoot one way first and then they shoot, light the other side. Got but it. But you lose stuff sometimes in terms of improvising. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what um, Shauna, we talked to Shauna Hagen, who was a camera operator on Parks, and she was always talking about how, like, her and the the other camera operator, Tom, would kind of create relationships with the actors. Like, she, Shauna said that she had a lot of, um, like, uh, relationship or, uh, I guess, communication with um, Nick Offerman. And so she would, like, always catch what he was doing. Or if she caught something, like, off the corner of her eye or, like, didn't always catch it, she'd be like, wait, do that again. <laughs> or something like that, you know? Yeah. Which seems so collaborative and amazing yes also it's the thing too of they're on set and they're getting used to the rhythm of the scene right Mm -hmm. because you rehearse it once or twice and then but it's normally like three or four in that the camera is now working and everybody's feeling how the scene is moving Mm -hmm. and even though it's improvised and it's kind of loose um we're letting the cameraman find it yeah so totally. we're not telling, I mean, I'm, I'm sure some directors are sort of directing them a little bit, mm-hmm. but, but they're allowing all that to feel like natural in a, in a way that isn't feeling forced. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Um, my other question too was about like the different, uh, which we've kind of talked a lot about a little bit, but like the different titles of producers. So one of the ones that I've been finding a lot on parks and the office and things like that are consulting producers. Um, what exactly does that entail? Well, a consulting producer, like, uh, is a bit of a, a, a rip off in a way. So, <laughs> well, like because uh, um, I was, my family moved back to Canada and there were, were like, uh, and so a consulting producer is someone who works four days a week, maybe sometimes, or three days a week. Like on when I was on Brooklyn Nine Nine, I asked to be, because I they're, they're, uh, my dad was ill and my mom was not doing well as well. So I, I asked for three days a week on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So I ended up uh, just doing three days a week and then went back to four days. But four days, I did four days in the beginning. I was working very long hours. And I was even though I was working four days a week, it was crazy. And then when we won for the Globe, I didn't get a, I didn't get a trophy at all because what? I didn't have the, the produce, co-executive producer credit, which is basically what I was doing. But I had yeah. the consulting. So I was... I was sacrificed the day that I got to go home and fly home and get spend time uh, with family um, versus like getting the title so gotcha mm-hmm. but like what is what, I mean it sounds like you had a lot of the same responsibilities like yes. what was the what was I the was running rooms and I was title? rewriting stuff and I was doing everything a co-executive producer was doing but I was uh, I asked for that title so I could get that day off oh so, so that's literally the only difference yeah Wow. Time commitment vibe. Okay. Yeah. And so like the executive slash like so, but that's, would be that was for game. me. That was for me. But you work your way up. Like that's a consulting producer gig. But as a producer, you're mid-level. So you can be a producer. I asked for a producer because I could, if we won a trophy that I would get a trophy. <laughs> yeah. So it was crazy. It was like the, the silliness of, of that. That's so fast. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm learning again so much. So there's, and the executive producer is one that would, in your position right, or your experience rather, w- was like a five day, like you're on set all the time. Yes. Yeah, so right, and you're have, overseeing a lot of stuff. So I, when I did uh, like Space Force or when I did, um, uh, I was showrunner. So I would get executive producer credit as well. Okay, gotcha. And I'm guessing that also uh, would relate to like your, your pay too, right? Yes. Okay, okay. And, and responsibility and ten, tense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the amount of work that you had to, and things you would have to worry about. You bring, you bring it home more with you than you would mm-hmm. if you were just a producer gotcha. writer that could, were concerned about your own script. You're okay. now overseeing all the scripts and the arc okay. and all that stuff. So, like, 
Okay. If I, like, if you had, okay, how do I ask this question? I guess the <laughs> easiest way would be, like, if I wanted to be a producer or if someone wanted to be a producer, would, at this time, from what I'm hearing slash looking at researching all this stuff, it seems like a lot of it's packaged at the beginning is spent, essentially, like, you have to have two things. Like, you have to be a writer and an actor or an actor, rather, to be a producer as well on the show. But is that true still? Or like- well, no, I think that it's a different thing for actors in terms of, like, uh, like Amy's the story star of the show so she would get a producer credit or um you know uh so it just works out that way that's part of the deal i think um and but amy was uh involved and and it would show and she did a lot of writing on the show and she actually directed as well Mm -hmm. and then she would show up in the room and 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 visit and find out what was going on so she was more hands-on you know in terms of um of what she wanted to uh, be a part of. Uh, I don't, I haven't been a part of, uh, um, of it where the, the actor has a producer credit and never shows up. I, I, maybe there is, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, I, um, it seems like I, most actors, if they're a producer on the show, they really want to be involved in what's yeah, happening. Yeah, I think you know? so. Why yeah. not? I mean, um, you've asked for the credit. Why not be a part of it to find out how it works, you know? And so, yeah. I think in the early, like uh, early stages, I was a co-producer, supervising producer. You just work your way up into um, becoming like a co-executive producer. Right. Producer. But would you say that you would probably need experience in some other realm of it as far as like writing or acting or something to work into that producer role? Or can you start? Sure. As, like, I feel like it all, producer, it's a bonus. It's a bonus for uh, someone who's a writer uh, performer. Mm hmm. Uh, because they 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 just seeing a person uh, that is an actor walk into a room, I think just helps you, you know. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they also say, "Hey, I've got a show idea where uh, uh, I'm performing." They go, "Oh, I've seen you perform. I know what it's going to be like." Right. So, and then they want to say, "I would like to produce it." And they go, "Oh, sure, okay." Yeah. I feel like that's just an easier route route for a uh, right um, actors. Yeah. Uh, writers is a bit t- tougher. They have to go through, uh, you know, their an associate script supervising, whatever those smaller yes. things. They have to go through those steps and it's harder for them. Uh, now I think it's being separated more and it's not mm-hmm. good. It's I feel like the steps were good and you that's how you got good show writers. And, totally. Uh, and they worked their way through and they got to be in a writing room and they got to see how that worked and they got to watch other showrunners i've been lucky in like that be the, trained almost you yes know? and i've watched show people run shows and go oh i want to run a show like that oh i don't want to run a show like that so um and just meeting other showrunners who uh come and go from um being a showrunner back to the writing room like yeah. um you're um like mike scully was a consulting producer mm-hmm. and he worked four days a week too and he but but he was a guy that ran rooms and so you get to ask them questions of what it was like to run a room and what they think is a good way to run a room. And Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. For the listener or for you, maybe uh, Mike Scully was on the show as the one with, like, the little um, pig, tiny, uh, like, stuffed animal things. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he had, like, a Tom Selleck yeah. version of Nick Offerman and, yeah. or Ron, I guess. Yeah. Um, I loved when we could see little Easter eggs of, like, the writers coming on the show. That was fun. Yeah. But, but yeah, okay, so that's really interesting to learn about the different titles. But I could also, and also, like, how you would get involved with it. I guess I could also see, like, if you know someone or if they know your work, like, asking um, you to come into the room and, like, maybe be start as a consulting producer. Like, is that a thing potentially, too? They've brought me on for things that Greg has brought me on to sort of uh, help with story on other things to consult. And so it's, mm-hmm. like, short periods of time, so it's not, you're not... But he has also brought me on to run shows too. So, gotcha. uh, um, so he uses all the he knows all the aspects of writing because he's a writer himself, right? So, yeah. I prefer wor- working with writer uh, producers, executive producers who have written. Yeah, and and he sort of um, knows the value of that, you know. Yeah, totally. He seemed to have changed the game and like yeah. how the hierarchy and all that stuff kind of works as a collaborative form, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Okay, well, we haven't really talked about parks, I guess, as much as <laughs> people probably wanted to, but I don't care because I That's had so okay. many questions. <laughs> yeah, I think we've wanted for a really long time because we've had some guest stars come on and we've gotten that kind of piece of it, but 
we don't get a ton of people on who do all the the backgrounds all the stuff that happens behind yeah, the crew. camera right? right so yeah so I, yeah we've had really like good. directors and obviously the camera operators and things like that but it's just really interesting to hear from someone that we haven't really had the uh knowledge of what the role entails you know mm-hmm. so right. that's so fascinating um but i was gonna say um uh, so we bought w- the last episode that we reviewed was born and raised where leslie is not in uh or not born in pawnee she was born in right. Pendleton, and i literally bought the book uh the pawnee the greatest town in america um I have it. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and I like bookmarked all these things that I was like had to show Maddie and tell everybody on the show. And my main question, honestly, I don't know if you can answer it, but like I just don't know how they did this as far as like who wrote it, who produced this book. I feel like this was a huge thing. I think that uh, Mike Shore kind of oversaw it, but he had he brought someone in, I think, to oversee it under him okay um so it was an outsider but it's someone he knew hmm. uh, and had uh worked with and liked their writing and i think they wrote books or articles i can't remember oh. now because it's only credited as written by leslie nope and then it says like nbc universal and i was like uh hello <laughs> you know, we all we all wrote on it too i think okay. there's special That's thanks what I was guessing. um in there so uh, they were farm, little pieces that were farmed out to different people. So I think I wrote, helped write some of the background history stuff, the smaller snippets. And I, I and just you, am seeing Nate DeMeo. Does that sound familiar? It says by Leslie might, Nope with Nate DeMeo and the creative team of Parks and Rec. I yes. didn't even see that before. Yeah. Who's Nate? Do you know Nate? Nate, uh, I think, is a person that... Uh, Mike knew and was a, a friend of maybe. Oh, okay, I'll have to Google him. I didn't even see his name until just now. I, so, I, did he end up writing an episode for us? I can't remember now. Nate DeMeo. He might have. Wait, DeMeo book. Do I wonder if the everybody name... had written pieces. I think uh, was Chelsea there. Chelsea Pretty might have written a piece, and Emily oh, Spivey sure. might have written a piece, and I wrote short snippets that were chosen and i wrote a lot of them and i think four or five got in or something but okay just, it says just... that he's the co-author of pawnee the greatest town i'm sorry to interrupt you i'm so yeah, sorry yeah. it says he is the co-author yeah, yeah. of pawnee the greatest yeah. town in america for and a finalist for the 2012 thurber prize for american humor so i'm po- yeah i'm sure that he was friends with mike okay anyways yeah. but that's all me and then yes um peretti was also on a lot of uh like she, not a lot of, but she was also a like a guest star, co star on one of the parks episodes too. Um, yes. So that was really cool to see. Yeah, yeah. No, but, I mean yeah. she's great. Chelsea mm-hmm. Pretty is great. Yeah, she's amazing. I just really was so interested it, because it's so detailed. This book, so I was just like, this has to have been from so many different people, so many different producers and writers and all the things. Yeah, so. and it was a different way to write too. You could be sillier, I think, uh, in with the book. Uh, 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 whereas on, you still have to sort of tell a story that's grounded on when you're doing Parks and Rec. But here we could go a little crazy and, and play with the, the background more and what happened yeah. more. More like the murals you, yeah. you see on the show. I love sort the murals. Of the silliness of that. <laughs> totally. Did you get to oversee those being created at all? Uh, yeah, we, we pitched on those in the beginning um, um, with a whole bunch. Greg really liked them and he thought they would be fun to see just as visual backgrounds. Because he just liked to have lots of comedy coming at you. And so that yeah. was in the background. And we thought, well, look, we'll, let's play with that. And so we sat in the room. I think we submitted ideas for that, too. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, and the person who did those murals, we talk about this on the show sometimes, also did the murals for um, Jerry's painting. The Yeah, I wrote the episode. So it was weird <gasps> to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, go down and have a look at those because the, you would say, what do you think of uh, the, yeah. <laughs> the picture? Yeah. Uh, Amy, I remember saying uh, this, it's so strange to look at those murals. She said, it was like, <laughs> I know it was like, I bet. Yeah. So you have to go down and approve of them. You go, yep. There oh my God. <laughs> wait. So, okay. Okay. Wait. So now I have a lot of questions. You guys, full disclosure, I was really only here to talk about producing, but now that I'm talking, I'm like, why didn't I even think about asking all these writing questions? Because obviously I will. Um, <laughs> but for Jerry's painting, okay. I have a question about um, the like inspiration for 
that episode? Do you remember like why I did? I pitched an idea that Jer- that Jerry pitched a lot of uh, like nudes of uh, or no, I pitched this idea that Jerry was painting people in the office, but there were nudes of people or something. <laughs> and uh, um, I think Dan Gore said that's too on the nose. You know, maybe should she should be on a centaur or something like that. And I went, oh, yeah, that's better. And then we ended up. Uh, so how do we work that into the Parks and Rec world? And it became like I, I, I thought it was something like Jerry had submitted these paintings for an art contest or something that yeah. was produced or that they were sort of pushing for in the arts department. And then he liked that. He said, well, maybe it's about nature or something. And then Jerry, and then also, then we thought in terms of story, where are we at with Adam and, and, um, you know, with, with, with uh, the characters of Ben and Leslie, you know, yeah. so they're dating, but not quite dating. And so, oh my God, it took so long. Yeah. And then <laughs> I know. And then we thought that, well, um, maybe it'd be good of like, like she's having to bury this part of her uh, personality. And then she loved the sort of like what, how Jerry kind of saw this, this Leslie in his mind, yes. even though it came out. Of, so, and she sort of just said, no, I'm taking back this, this part of me. And so mm. well, that all uh, seemed good. And then that's how it sort of came about. So it's just writers talking in the room, you know, but, mm-hmm. Uh, it's too on the nose. It is funny that you that Jerry kind of up, came up with this sort yeah. of notion of her and Caesar like that. But what's a better way to do it? And then the yeah. centaur seemed funny. That's amazing, and I love that Dionysus. I don't know who came up with that, but Dionysus is not like a real uh, goddess, is from no. from what I've learned. Mm-hmm. So it was. I kind of put it. I together don't know how that came about either. I actually, well, I forgot it seems like I... it could have just been a combination of real ones, yeah. like Aphrodite and yes. Dionysus yeah. is one, or Dion yeah. Dion something. Shoot, I forgot what it was. But anyways, um, speaking of that though, in the last episode we talked about how um, Ben. And Leslie don't even really have an interaction because this is when they've broken up because she is um, running for city council and it would be a whole scandal or whatever. Right. Um, but I am curious how you guys kind or if you remember like the conversation that happened about like, well, we got them together. Now let's break them up kind of thing. Like, do you remember any information about like how, how do we break them be? up? I'm trying to remember now. So. Like, so she runs for city council, but they say like, if you uh, the her campaign people are like, if there's any skeletons, in the right? Closet, so right. So we have to break up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, you, that just seems it's like you know it's that thing of avoiding right for a mm-hmm. long time the, and like you don't want it to, and you can avoid it for a certain amount of time before it becomes annoying even to the writers. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, uh, so how much longer do we have to keep them apart? And then, because we know they should get together yeah. and we want them to get together. But yet at the same time, so you slow roll it. And then you, uh, and then you, they're both noble people, you know, they don't want to, so you can get them together and then have them, one person make a sacrifice, you know? Yeah. And I feel like that's what we played with um, for a while too. So it's just, the push and pull of it. Right. And so, uh, and it's sort of feeling out the room and then feeling out the audience and then feeling out how long we can uh, keep them apart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I liked it because I felt like it was an amicable like breakup because Ben was very understanding that yes. she needed to run. She needed to run for herself. Um, so then as the audience, we don't yeah. have any ill will towards either of them with no, this breakup. No, they're doing it. She, he does. He know, likes her Leslie enough to know that it's important to her, and that, mm-hmm. and that, and she would then find that noble. And then so you go. That just wants you to want the audience and the writers' room to make them come together in a way that makes sense. You know. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. Also, speaking of all your like writing credits, I feel like you are really interested in writing for Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I ended up so writing. Yeah, I know episodes. I ended up writing for Jerry. I guess, but uh, yeah, the first one was the I think the painting, and yeah. so and then and Sweet th- Sixteen you've got, and then Jerry's yes. retirement. <laughs> yes, and Jerry's retirement. I get ended up uh, doing it, but 
That's so, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> yes, coincidence. I, because I ended up, I really liked write, writing for Ron and Leslie. And then so mm. I wrote a lot of mm. those types of ones like. Um, Ron and Tammy's. Uh, yeah, yeah. Where they had a total thing. Yes. And yeah. also the award. Woman of the uh, Year. The Woman of the Year, too. That's totally. a good one. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. I can't wait for that one. We yeah. haven't reviewed that one. That's yet. a That's great cool. relationship. I love that relationship. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's so rare to, I mean, at least when Parks came out, right? It was rare to watch a show where there wasn't like every man-woman relationship had to have some sort of yeah, romantic chemistry. Yeah, they could be chemistry. friends, you know, yeah. uh, which I liked and they respected each other. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people thought that they would get together, which I don't, I didn't like that idea. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no. Yeah. no. Yeah. And I love that, I love that, the respect for each other. We talk about this a lot on the podcast, the respect they have for each other, even though they disagree on fundamentally oh, most everything. Yeah. So. They can have different viewpoints, but still admire the other person's take on it. Or And mm-hmm. and there's the, the, the just that she was a hardworking person, I think. That's what the common ground was for the two of them, you know, because he liked hard people who worked hard. Mm-hmm. Although he didn't work he hard. He didn't work hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> he yeah. works hard in things he likes. Yeah, yes. yeah, the things he likes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, totally. Oh my um, god, that's hilarious. And you can respect that about Leslie, you know. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, Blue and season is one of I my was just absolute say, favorite episodes. Blue season <laughs> was crazy because how does it feel to predict the future <laughs> like yeah, right? that? And ninety five was well, wild. We didn't. Okay, not really. Yeah, know, back then, I know. I know. <laughs> that was, was so crazy just, though. Yeah, watching yeah. it was seemed yeah. so uh, crazy to us. It feels weird now. Yeah. Yeah, it does feel weird now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, it was yeah. weird watching. Uh, during COVID, watching shows that didn't deal with COVID. Mm-hmm. There you go. You can't walk into a restaurant now. You can't even sit down at a restaurant. That you had to. A lot of. I remember during. I was uh, worked on the reboot of Kids in the Hall, and and Kevin and I would walk into restaurants, and you would just. It was it's a delivery service. You couldn't sit down in a restaurant and eat. So yeah. you would pick mm-hmm. up food from that restaurant and totally take it back to your place and. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I mean, in that, even in that episode, I mean, Ben does visit Leslie, and even that you couldn't do, you know, in the no. hospital, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? No. But I think um, seeing Chris react yes. to that in flu season would have been, like, gnarly to see how he would have reacted to COVID. COVID. <laughs> yes, and I believe that he had, had a, a good fear of what was to come, mm-hmm. he, you know. Mm-hmm. He predicted the future, I think, a little bit. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. That is so wild. Yeah. <laughs> how how loopy everybody gets is my absolute favorite. The fact that Chris is trying to tell himself to stop pooping in the mirror and, <laughs> yes. and uh, Leslie when she goes in and she yeah. turns and faces the wall and says, I'm Leslie Monster. That's like one of my favorite <laughs> moments. <laughs> Yeah, and also, I mean, was that technically, or do you remember your idea to have when she gets up to the podium to have her be completely like lucid and regular and professional? Yes. Wow, that's like amazing. she kind of like had it enough in her, like she knew that she was saving herself for that moment, and then mm. once it was over, then she went back to this <laughs> like apart. I, yeah, I'm now drained. I'm yeah. now gonna, I'm back to. Uh, loopy leslie so yeah Yeah. it totally reminds me of like doing theater shows or like if you anybody like has like a project that they have to do it's like you your body just does what it needs to do yeah and then as soon as it's over it's like okay we're gonna go be awful now (laughs) yeah it's like that thing of of like where you work really hard and then when you're on vacation you go okay i can relax and that's when you get sick right Mm -hmm. exactly yeah totally that makes so much sense yeah i mean do you have any like I guess stories of being in the writer's room and then being kind of stuck or having something shot down, especially with Parks and Rec. Like, do you remember of anything of that nature? Um, There are ideas that people like that just like everything where uh, we never figured out how to make it work or, Mm. um, but for the most part, I think um, uh, like for the fourth season, we kind of knew where it was going, you know, because mm-hmm. she was running for office. Although that was a big topic of conversation in, mm. at the end of the third year, because the, the second and third year were kind of fun years in terms of like figuring everything out and mm-hmm. where it was going. And um, then we said, OK, she's going to run for office. And we went, well, what does that mean in terms of it's called Parks and Recreation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, should we do this? Uh can we sort of like cross over and we and it sort of was a big discussion and saying, well, uh, there were more stories to be had for her doing that. 
Yeah. So we were, we thought, okay, let's do, that's the fourth season. We'll worry about where it ends. Mm-hmm. And then, then, in the, and at the end of the fourth season, they go, okay, now what? <laughs> like, right. You know, well, so. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think about this a lot because like with certain, with certain shows, because, um, like just the tra- trajectory of where the character is going. Like for example, um, I watched. I'm a huge Friends fan because I am, and I watched the reunion, and I didn't realize that Monica and Chandler's relationship really wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the audience, um, because they said that um, they kind of just did that for a funny thing, like them getting right. together, and then the audience was so obsessed with it that they decided to continue it. And then they kept getting more obsessed with it in X, Y, and Z. So like, I guess I wonder if there's, that was what that question was kind of leading towards of like, where was there anything that you had, you didn't think was going to go somewhere. And then it actually did, you know what I mean? Or that, that kind of vibe. Um, well, the, uh, Chris, I mean, um, uh, Andy and April's story was sort mm-hmm. of like, we, we didn't know that was going to be a thing we put them in a b story together and we saw that oh they had a oh, lot yeah. of chemistry mm-hmm. and so uh we felt oh uh that feels good like they they're playful and they like each other and maybe it seemed to us that april could like andy because he was uh the type of guy that she could like you know yeah mm-hmm. so um, we found um that sort of uh, became a thing just because we threw them together yeah, and had to figure out a B story because we went well. Everyone's taking story, uh, everyone's taking care of in the A story, but not in the B story. Totally. And who do we have left? And they were. That's so wild. Yeah. I know. I remember thinking that, or we found that somewhere, that it wasn't meant to be like as big as it got. But that's so mm-hmm. fascinating to hear. Yeah, that's really cool. And also, you know, in the I think it was the end of the second and the beginning of the third season when they want. The network wanted Rob Lowe and they liked Rob Lowe and they right. thought that they could be good for the show. And then we, we said, well, we like Adam Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Can we bring him on? So we have two people. And so we had two people. And then we, we didn't know. Uh, and it was, we were searching with Leslie trying to find someone to date and who, who, who do we hook up Leslie? So that was an experiment and we didn't know that it would lead. We kind of knew, I guess, because Adam could be a nerd. Yeah. She was a bit of a nerd. But we didn't know. We had her dating uh, quite a few people. And so yeah, um, it just sort of... Uh, and then she liked the idea of dating Louis C.K. for a while because he was just funny, you know? Mm-hmm. And so... Um, and she was saying, well, why does she, she have to date good-looking guys all the time? You know, or mm. lookers, you know, people yeah. who are... So I feel like that kind of... It's, you just sort of you're in the room and you're just feeling it and you're just playing with stuff. And then, and then it just takes a, uh, its own direction. Yeah. Well, and especially at the beginning, we didn't know that they were going to get together at all. No, they mm-hmm. kind of hate each other. They hated each other. Yes. Like the first three episodes. <laughs> yeah. We liked, we liked that aspect of playing with that. And then, and then um, I think they thought that maybe a, a Robin uh, with uh you know, it would be good. Chris and Leslie would be good, but it didn't feel right to us. So just, That's too know. much high energy yeah, in yeah, one relationship. <laughs> no, absolutely no. not. No. And it, he was sort of, we thought he would be a little bit more evil, but we liked him in his, he was evil in a way that wasn't just pure evil. You know, it was like, mm-hmm. right, right, right. He's right. saying, come on, this is what government is. And she was like, even for her, it was like, ugh. You know? It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, did you have someone that you, I mean, I said this kind of jokingly liking to write for Jerry, but um, do you have anybody in particular uh, that you liked to write for as far as their storylines or character wise? I like the Ron Leslie stuff. So, oh, if okay. I, yeah, I really liked them two together. They were a lot of fun together. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and you know Adam and uh, Amy are good together. It's you. You just find stuff that, it's as you're writing it, you just find it, and you go, "Oh, that works," and then those are fun to write for. You know, uh, yeah. Jerry just came about because as a, as the series goes on, you go, "Okay, sh- is there a story for Jerry?" Yeah, because <laughs> we I think we always thought of one for Donna too, but there was there was little things that l- led. Uh, more information about Donna that you found out about her, but mm-hmm. I don't think there was a real straight up Donna one until later, right? I think. Uh, so. Yeah, it's a lot of it's like Donna and Tom together. Yes, or and Donna Donna's and wedding, Anne. Yes, yeah, really... that's right. Yeah, 
uh, in there. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I guess um, also if you um, – this, I always ask this question, usually toward the end, but I'm just curious now that we're talking about characters. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you, like, could relate to a certain um, character, like, who would you think that you are in your real life? Well, there's aspects of Jerry in there that I, <laughs> I sort of get. But yeah. – uh, um, but all of them, really. I mean, I, I for me, it was always like uh, I liked Leslie because she was always trying to do right by the town, mm -hmm. and then took a lot of guff. And I thought um, I liked that part of her. She, there was a moral backbone to her stuff that I mm -hmm. I can relate to, like like and and has fallen away. It seems in politics, you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And Veep, they explored the, the falling away of a moral background. Oh, my God. Veep was so good. Yeah. Oh my and, I, yes. and I and they went deep into that. But I like that, that she was really trying to uh, do the right thing by everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I relate a lot to Leslie and how hard yeah. and, like, everything is. But also trying to, like, remain positive through all the yeah. hardships. Yeah. <laughs> And she was a real, uh, and then you could see her get down and get annoyed, but then get angry at herself for getting annoyed. And yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. okay. My last question about, well, I think it's my last question about Jerry. Um, who slash do you remember the uh, conversation about making him be so like swaggery at home and like so cool yeah. at home, but not at work? <laughs> I feel like because we were beating him up quite a bit in <laughs> in the office that we thought we had to give him something that he, he, his home life was pretty great. And he, mm. because it was so good, he didn't mind. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, the, the being that kind of a person at the office and that yeah. it was a surprise, not only to, as you dug deeper to the people at work, but also to the, the audience, you know, so that they were discovering things and, and then you could, you don't want, him just to be a punching bag yeah i mean we right. talk about that especially in the first season and some of the second season we're just like this is so mean yeah <laughs> i can't get over it <laughs> but leslie was the kind of person that what i liked about she was on the fence it's like she would protect jerry but at the same time then join in with the group like 100 right. she yeah. was like trying really hard to be the good guy and yeah. then she just couldn't resist making yeah. fun of some of the things that he did which like to be fair i get it like yeah, you know, yeah. oh come on your jerry pants and farting yeah, yeah. like come on yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the office that's why i love when ben like stands up for him later he's like finally has like a, a point of solidarity right <laughs> yes captain, my captain <laughs> yes. yeah yeah that's amazing. Oh, my God. Uh, well, do you have any other memories that you think that you would love to share with everyone else? Or you can tell me later. <laughs> um, no, I, I just the it was the memory. That I like it's just the as the whole trip it, because I was brought in from the beginning. So I could see yes. like from the start how a show finds itself. And yeah. I feel like most shows find itself around the third season or something. Mm -hmm. And you could see it in the second season moving, even in the rock show after the, like I could see in the first season, I could see them, not the mistakes, but the things we were trying that weren't quite working to like mm -hmm. work out. Yeah. Uh, and, and then starting to work on rock show. So you, you could just watch like, Oh, that's getting in. This is not getting in. Oh, that's yeah. working, but this is not working. And it's just from watching the episodes and getting it. So uh, um, for me, the trip and the, that cast was just so good. Mm -hmm. And then how a cast sort of just becomes a cast and how it evolves. Um, Such a team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's a give and take on the set all the time, you know, it's like just going down there and maybe saying, I don't know if this works or, oh, this is great. Or, and then so you know what's working and that's just reporting back to the room. Like this is working, this isn't working. And that's the great thing of be, being on set is that you could do that. You could go back to the room and go, hey, just so you know, I was on an episode where that came up. And so yeah, we that's can so avoid true. that. I didn't yeah. even think about that. That's true. Yeah. Okay, wait, I have a scandalous question. And you don't, we can cut this out if you need to. Oh. But um, I want to know what the heck and what the conversation was about Mark not being on the show anymore. It's not so scandalous <laughs> for me. It, it's in like a... I feel it's like sort of, between Parks fans, we're all just like, right? what even what happened? happened? No, so many just, people are Team Mark or Team Not Mark, yeah, and I'm Team Mark. I liked him. I didn't. Whatever. I liked him. Um, okay, and thank I, you. And he and he was uh, 
he didn't have the improvising background um, that a lot of the people had on the show. So um, when you asked him, because Adam Scott. Okay, sorry. But Adam Scott, (laughs) I I saw an interview with him recently. He said he was there and he learned uh, how Mm -hmm. to improvise when Mm -hmm. he was thrown into that fire with uh, Adam McKay and the way he approaches this sort Mm -hmm. of stuff. And so uh, it's just the way um, uh, he, so by the time he came to us, he was already, he, he could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but uh, he was a film actor, uh, you know? And uh, so when, Who, when Mark? we brought him, yeah, Mark. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. And so he, he sort of had, uh, uh, and it was sort of an indie guy. Uh, and I, I like seeing that. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I do like, I did like his approach, but you could, uh, he would do takes and you could cut together a take. I was fine with that because I came from a film background. I go, oh, you just have to cut together a take for him. Yeah. Uh, whereas you could, with Amy, you can get a take from her when, in improv- improvising. Oh, okay. Um, but also I think that as the show moved on, we thought, oh, he sort of, we think they'll get together. And, and in the first season, as we were doing it, I thought, uh, I think we were we we're doing the rock show episode, mm-hmm. and I think it was Greg who said we could do the boring thing where they get together and we can have them get together, or we could have them not get together and she could push him into the pit and that's a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. And I went, oh yeah, that's just that's funnier. It is. And it was just a funnier story move. Yeah. And so in the second season, it wasn't because of him. It was more about. This is now we've made a decision in terms of how we're moving forward and how they're mm. getting together. And do we want them to get together? Yeah, that was that, definitely that's sort of the conversation we had question. more of in the room. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't it wasn't anything personal about him. Sure. It was like now, like we thought we wanted them together. Now do we want think we want them together? And sort of was like that question. And we thought and when they were, it's sort of, for him, it's not fun because he's thought, oh, I'm going to be part of the big thing. But now it's just in terms of story moves. Now we're just sort of saying, do we want that? And yeah. so it wasn't a personal thing. It was, but how do you navigate that water now? It's like totally. you have to go to the actor and go, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. now bringing in more people and he can see the writing on the wall. And we said, we bring you around and we're, we're going to introduce more people into the world. And then we thought, oh, we'll have him and Anne get together. Yeah. And then, and then now we're just moving him around, you know. I see. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like it just like a puzzle piece wasn't really matching. Yeah. 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 Then it we was, should like, see that too. from the start. I was like, no, this is our guy. We want it. This is him. Yeah. You know? Well, and as you were saying, um, the I. I mean, just, I'm speaking from my own personal fan experience. I don't see them together at all. I definitely always saw them more as friendship. Mm-hmm. And definitely with, like, Leslie's uh, character development. You're yes, kind of exactly. Seeing... It was a character thing. It's like, do will we like Leslie, who's the star of the show, if she goes back to this guy and just... Mm-hmm. We know the backstory. Yeah. It wasn't a pleasant backstory. So... Um, and but it's at, an interesting point, backstory. Said it a hundred times too. Yeah, you know what I mean. Right. So, yeah, that makes sense. It does make sense. And I could yeah. also see, like, I could have seen him coming back maybe a little bit more to like help out or be friends or whatever. Because I right. think his the big thing that I liked um, was when she was trying to fill in the pit, and he gave her that advice of like, don't ask for yes. permission, ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and I don't think she would have gotten that from anybody else. No. And then I feel like she, like, and they, he still respected her in a different way too. Not just like mm. he was a bit of a player, um, but um, totally. Uh, uh, at the same time, then thought, well, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think it's fair to Leslie to that. Yeah. I just, I think he knew too. So I just, it was just in terms of writing. I feel like it felt right, and and then. Um, it's unfortunate in like uh, how it kind of went that way. But I, I like, I did like his performance and I, yeah. cause he was small. You know, like his, totally. his performance moves were small and not big in, in a way. And right. it sort of was a nice contrast to other moves on the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, look, I will say at the, the way that his storyline wrapped up was perfect. To yes. Me. Mm-hmm. 
I yeah. think that it well, totally yeah, we wrote, honored it for sure. Like uh, honor yeah, is a great yeah, word for it. Yeah. I feel like it definitely gave him the the wrap up that we needed. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I mean, also, look, if I had to decide between Ben and Mark for Leslie, like we all know the answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my yeah. thing is like like the other question you could ask that same question of Anne's character yeah. too. Where, where, you know, we had her, she was a best friend and she was a good friend. And then once we brought in Adam and they got closer, she she could turn to Anne for certain things, but would turn to uh, to Ben's character for totally. other things and then mm-hmm. rely on him more as they got closer. So mm-hmm. we ended up in a weird way. And I think that Rashida knew, like, like well, so what am I doing on the show yeah. now, you know? And so I feel like it just sort of eased out in a way in a different way too, you know, she lasted mm-hmm. longer, but it's just the way that the, the, the clay was made, you know, and then. Yeah. Well, and you always need you... your best friend when you have a relationship as yes. well. Mm-hmm. So you always need that, uh, that other sounding ear. board. Yeah. Yes. So that makes a total, total sense. Um, yeah. I can't say I like, I mean, this isn't necessarily, this is not a critique at all. I love Parks and Rec and I will stand by it forever and ever and die on that hill. But I don't know that how I feel about Chris and, and, ending up like being married and i understand why it had to happen as far as like them both being off the show kind of vibe mm-hmm. but i don't know if i understand their relationship well yeah that was always tricky i think it was um i but think they both we had grew i will say yeah. that yeah. i feel yep. like they definitely both grew from the first time they were together to the second time so like yes. i totally understand that part of it but yeah um yes and uh, i think for sure it was uh i think we had more trouble with the mark uh, and relationship mm-hmm. uh, I think and then and so we, we we collapsed that and then we had you know um yeah it's a tricky one that one I was gone by that time so I don't oh, know okay. I didn't hear the conversations in the room mm-hmm. and I find that valuable as why how they come about or what getting them back together or why yeah. they got back together yeah um I mean, it makes sense as far as like them both wanting to leave at the same time um, right. from that logistical standpoint, I suppose. But um, but yeah, I mean, what so what season did you get into? I got to see end of season five and then I went to Brooklyn Nine-Nine. OK, yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. OK. Maddie loves Brooklyn Nine-Nine. That's one Brooklyn. of her fave shows. <laughs> Andy Samberg is one of my favorite people. Oh, ever. he's the best. I find that those and, and Amy, too, that they're very easy uh, to talk to about uh because they were writers too, and and mm-hmm. were in troops and stuff, and so they mm-hmm. understand what it's like to be part of that. So it's a team effort for them all the time, and I, I like that aspect, that that yeah. approach. He I just know. seems so, and I I don't have a lot of go to go off off of him, right? On on Amy, we've talked to a lot of people who say she is just so genuine and so lovely, yeah. but the vibe I get from him and in, in his performances, but also his interviews, is that he's also just a super chill, genuine. He person. is. Yeah, he is totally that. And then and and uh, I, I I was a big fan of the, his troupe because I was in uh, Kids in the Hall. So I they and having been on Saturday Night Live too, he figured out mm-hmm. how to get those short films on there. And oh, I yeah. thought I thought uh, that he figured it out and that troupe figured it out. Uh, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, those are some of my favorite yeah. pieces of um, SNL in the early two thousands. Is the yeah, Lonely yeah. Island songs and his little yeah. digital shorts. And so. it's hard to do musical comedy uh, mm-hmm. well, and yeah. they did it well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Oh my God, I just went to Chicago and saw uh, Second City because uh, in LA I took classes at IO West, RIP. Um, so I went to IO Chicago yeah. and I went to um, Second City and we saw a bunch of like musical improv and it's just so hard. And like we saw the headliner sketch show and all these things. And it was just like so amazing to see kind of like the, I guess, genesis of it all. <laughs> you know yes. what I mean? Because so yeah. all, all of those people have studied at those places and Tina Fey and Amy Poehler are like, you know my favorite people so it's really and awesome when i was doing kids in the hall my biggest our we were fans of sctv the tv show and oh it yeah was duh. john candy and you know and Catherine o'hara and uh, you know the canadian icons yeah, yeah they were <laughs> just uh, we were fans of theirs so uh, they influenced us for sure you know yeah well and there's a second city in toronto right uh, uh yes I think yeah okay 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 yeah. I didn't know if it was in Vancouver or Toronto but the the um the Toronto one is really big too so I mean oh huge uh, Andrea Martin and like there's just yeah. uh, great people from uh, that came down from 
Chicago too that uh, helped create that that atmosphere in Toronto. Ah, oh, love it so cool. much! Oh my gosh. Well, Maddie, do you have any other questions that you are uh, thinking about? Yes, I just had one more pop into my head because I went back onto the SNL train. So and Chicago. <laughs> so I we went to Chicago and it so happened that like a half a mile from our hotel there was an SNL museum, like it was a traveling museum. An actual museum? Yeah, but it was wow. like a traveling one. So they like had Gilly's costume. They had like all these costumes, a bunch like of Like a pop-up? Oh. Yeah. And it, it, they had, um, what's it called? The, like the cue, like cue, old cue cards in there. But the way they designed it was really cool. You walked through the rooms, but it was as the day of the week. So you walked into ah, Monday cool. and they told you what happened at SNL on Monday. Right. Like how long did everybody work? what was the process and then you go into Tuesday and so on. So going in that, it looks like you guys don't sleep and there's literally no free time and that you're yeah. just working. Did you feel a shift? Was it as pressing when you got into like Parks and Rec and TV stuff or was SNL like a whole different beast? SNL is a whole different beast for sure. Because I worked on Kids in the Hall, so I was working with friends and then mm-hmm. Lauren Michaels gave us said, here's the show, you guys work on it. And they didn't know what we did. We did this crazy show. And then so when I went to SNL, I was on now his show. So it was mm-hmm. a different vibe. And there's like, that's my first introduction to show business. And I also had two young children. I had, yeah, um, that's hard. my wife was pregnant. And I also had a two-year-old daughter. And so it was like, I was working with people who are out of college, who were writers from Harvard, who <laughs> could party nonstop. So I was like in my 30s, I think, and these were all young people. That was, I just found it very hard to, um, you know, work those late hours. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, uh, you know, like uh, I think Chris Elliott did it for a year and then just left. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's a real grind, you know. So, and I did it for three years and I found it very hard. It's a mm-hmm. lifestyle for sure. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. I yeah, can't yeah. believe Keenan's done it for 20 plus oh my years. Oh my God. Like that guy, that guy, he probably runs on caffeine and other things. I don't. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't crazy. know. I don't know, oh, man. But yeah, it just seemed crazy. So I didn't know if all TV shows function that way or if SNL Oh, no, no, no. It was like you had to. Uh, so Saturday Night Live, you, you like you finish the Saturday night show and then you have Sunday off. And then Monday, you have to go in and pitch another uh, show. So, if, so sometimes you would have three weeks in a row that you would do the show. And then have two weeks off. And then you those two weeks off were valuable because you could think of ideas during that time. Mm-hmm. But if you had three weeks in a show, you were off, uh, you know, one day and you were back and you were having to pitch a, a show on Monday to a new guest. And you sometimes you didn't even know who the guest was. So it was like Yikes. crazy. So you had to go in and pitch and then you go, is this a good idea? You sometimes <laughs> weren't sure. And, but what was great is they had the support of other writers and mm. performers there. And so you, if you had an idea that you thought was okay, you could hold on to it and then maybe not write it. But there was always always pressure to like, you know, put something out every week. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I remember as a fan when they would like release the, here are the next couple weeks of, you know, guest stars and yes. and musicians and then i'd see like a two week gap between two episodes i'm like why i don't want to wait two weeks for snl and then when i did that tour i was like that's why yes they would all die you, yeah you get burnt out and yeah. even then you were like because then i would have uh, be at home and then with the, my wife and child and she was pregnant and then so like <laughs> that's a different vibe right mm-hmm. and then so it was a uh, it was pretty crazy on kids in the hall you could sit on an idea for a very long time mm-hmm. and not have to and say is this a film idea is this a, a studio idea is this you know but uh, with the saturday night live it was always a studio idea so you're having to sort of figure out how to present that mm-hmm. interesting and it's such a short deadline as well and it's oh, live yeah. oh as, gosh, opposed, yes. as opposed to like you trying to uh, pitch something uh, or and having something in the script and then on the day of you can be like that doesn't work let's change it and we have like and you know maybe we have 20 minutes to actually fuck around and see what happens yeah. with it, if that you know what I mean so you can't do that on SNL <laughs> no you can't and then normally you have the, the table read and then that night and then you have a rewrite the next day and then you're doing it on Thursday and it's up on the floor and then you're 
like Friday, you're looking at it and, and then Saturday it's in front of an audience and, yeah. you know, and then you go, oh, is it going to work? And you go, oh, it didn't work. And then yes. you worked all week on it. So it's like, uh, um, and it, sometimes it did work and sometimes you went, it's just not a, they chose it for whatever reason. Sure. It's like, you know. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. It's crazy. It's a whole other country, I feel. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, know. for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Well, we just appreciate you so much. That yeah. is, we, I learned so much and I am sure that I will have follow-up questions that I may or may not email you about. And okay. Yeah, sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. But yeah. we loved having you. I think this was such a learning experience for everybody and just so important to learn how the crew and writers all work together with the actors and yeah, it's everything is sport. just mm-hmm. so yeah. elaborate. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. exactly. So we just thank you so much. We really appreciate all right. it. All right. Well, thanks for having me on and thanks for asking. Of course. Oh, my gosh. Let us know if there's anything that you think of. We are all ears. And um, when we get to your next episode that you wrote, I'm sure I'll have more specific questions. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Okay, Well, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. There's a park and some pals, and there's also therapy, too.